Hello, everyone, and welcome to Debuff Wildstar Night. Uh, I'm your host, August, this evening, and joining me is Creed, who will be the executive officer in Grievance's Wildstar Dominion Guild. How are you doing, Creed? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Good to be here. Doing good. Uh, joining us tonight, we have a very special guest, uh, Gareth Gazimov Harner. Uh, welcome, Gareth. Thank you for joining us. Uh, could you Thank tell you. us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, I am Gareth Harmer, also known as Gazimov, uh, currently the Wildstar columnist for MMORPG.com. I've uh, been following the game since its announcement back in Gamescom 2011. And yeah, really looking forward to this one coming out. Really looking oh, forward well, to it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're all real excited about Wildstar. Disconnected. Can't get enough. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 such an interesting mesh of loads of different concepts, and I think it's really trying to evolve the whole what it what an MO actually means these days. Um, I think it's going to be really really interesting when it comes out, particularly on the raiding front. Particularly on the raiding front. Yeah, it looks really interesting. Um, when you started out your career, did you think you'd be writing about video games, or did you have something else in mind? So. When I actually started out, well, when I came fresh out of university some 10 years ago now, so I'm feeling a bit old, yeah. um, <laughs> I thought I'd actually start out working as some kind of software engineer. So one of the big software companies that are here in the UK, I thought I'd end up working for one of those. But it, it turned out that there wasn't that huge demand for software programmers at the time. This was just at the turn of the millennium when we had that big industrial crash right. and computer jobs were pretty much nowhere. So I ended up doing IT support for a couple of years, which was horrible, uh, and then got into telecoms uh, through a friend and worked my way up there. But uh, I've always been kind of interested in MMOs because of the massively multiplayer aspects. And I've always felt that they have a very unique um, part of uh, gaming that you don't see anywhere else at all, uh, whether it's a first person shooter or whether it's uh, something like an RPG or a strategy, a turn based deal or real time strategy. They've always held that kind of peculiar fascination because you've got so much running behind the scenes. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've always kind of been interested in them, but writing about them, well, I didn't really think I'd end up doing that at all. It all kind of happened by accident almost, pretty much. It's the, the hands of fate working yeah, for well, <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I started blogging about MMOs um, about three, four years ago, uh, just writing how I felt about World of Warcraft at the time, which was the game I was playing. Uh, and focusing on mages because I, that's the class I was into and I was raiding probably three, four nights a week and I had some opinions on theory crafting, mechanics and stuff like that and I just wanted a place to write about it so I started doing that. Um, then when Wildstar came out I volunteered for, or Wildstar got announced, I volunteered for a fan site, Wildstar Source, uh, which has unfortunately since shut down but the, the guy who runs that uh, said, well, did I want to start writing for Zam? Because he was also involved with that uh, company as well. So I started writing for Zam um, initially as a staff writer, but then moving up to senior contributing editor and uh, then decided with uh, a couple of other changes to make the switch and go freelance. So currently I'm spending all my time writing about video games. That's awesome. I, I wish I had that kind of freedom. <laughs> do something I love it's it's kind of a big brave move at the moment I'm not sure how long it'll last on, on how long I'm gonna actually say nah I need to spend time actually looking for a, a proper job and earning some real money but uh, I'm enjoying it while I can well you picked the right game for it to, to start off with there's so much attention for Wildstar everybody's just chomping at the bit for anything anything Wildstar related I know I am yeah, yeah. I'd agree with that. I mean, there's, there's um, the Reddit community, there's Wildstar Central, there's uh, Wildstar Fans, Wildstar Roleplay, all of these community sites that are really hungry, are hungry for information. 
And I do my best to try and bring it out there, either through interviews or through my own opinions based on what I've seen and what I've heard from developers. Uh, it seems to be working. People seem to be liking it. But yeah, I, I've watched a few of your. Uh, uh, I watched the the Spell Singer class video that you did. Uh, that was pretty cool. And I, and I read a, I read a, the blog you released this morning uh, about the free to play aspect of MMOs. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really interesting as well. So, I was really lucky. I got invited to a uh, press event down in Brighton in February. Uh, where I was asked if I wanted to play Wildstar over, I think it was a two day, it was either a one day or a two day thing. Um, but I went down there, spent some, a lot of time playing the game, uh, spent some time talking to Mike Donatelli as well, the uh, design director, uh, and a bunch of the other guys. And that's when I first met up with Troy, uh, Scooter, and Loic, the three community guys that they had back then. Uh, and it was really, really interesting, real eye up there. Um, and that's when I first, when you first sit there and you've got the game running on a machine in front of you and you put your hands on the keyboard, it's like, whoa. <laughs> that that awe moment that you just realize you're finally there, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that, w that was a really early build. Um, even when I went back at Arkship, um, which was again in Brighton because NCSoft have their um, European community offices uh, and marketing, I think, as well down in Brighton. Uh, so when you uh, see like Anlaf, Mark Humes on Twitter, that's where he's uh, based in. And uh, so I went back there again and it had been updated and tweaks here and there and stuff like that. But it was it's still really good fun. Really good fun. I can't wait till it comes out. Yeah, we're all pretty excited. I, we've been all stoked about it for a long time. And uh, before I ask you uh, my questions, uh, just to point out something that you said at the beginning of your of, of your thing there about the rating. And uh, man, we are just so excited about the forty man raids coming mm -hmm. back with a whole new theme and, and all the stuff that you know the car lines putting into this. And man, we are just so excited about forty man raids and. And uh, and I, it's it's weird that you mentioned uh, World of Warcraft along with that too because it's been a long time since I've been in any of that stuff. <laughs> and and uh, but anyway, uh, my question to you is, uh, uh, it, uh, I guess your past life and a bio about you. Uh, you mentioned that your dad bought old ZX Spectrum with a dead flesh keyboard. Uh, <laughs> be willing to bet money that probably had a little bit with your career start there. Uh, uh, tell us more about what a ZX Spectrum is and how important was it to you while you okay. were you know, coming up and growing up? Sure. So um, this was in the days before we had PCs. Uh, the, there were the kind of like three or four microcomputers, which all came out in the early 80s. Uh, there was one like the Commodore Amiga. Uh, there was the a BBC Micro, which was made by our state uh, controlled television company uh, and there was another one which was the zx spectrum which was made by this slightly eccentric genius called uh, clive sinclair and it was basically like an overgrown pocket calculator it was about the size of this apple mac keyboard so i've got a wireless mac keyboard it's about that big um about the thickness of say two chocolate bars stacked on top of each other two Hershey bars stacked on top. Um, and the keyboard was this kind of rubber molding. So it felt like you had dead flesh or underneath your fingers because it wasn't like push button plastic keys. It was this rubber thing and it was like, and you had to type to get the games working. So you could either plug in a tape player and loading games or you'd have a book of listing a book of code that you'd buy from a, a game shop and type it in manually and yeah that came out in 1982 i think it was 1982 something like that uh, and that was my first experience at, com at uh, computing and computer gaming um it still works i still have it lurking around somewhere here oh, that's cool. but uh, it's... wow that's that's amazing I, I think my first computer game was pong so that's, <laughs> that, that's pretty wild I had a similar experience with the uh, the Apple IIe was my introduction into computing. 
and I, I got real into it, and I wanted to learn all about programming and stuff, and and then I, I joined a football for like a semester, and I came back, and computer changed, and basic was no longer programming language. <laughs> I was lost. I had to totally relearn the whole thing. Yeah, basic was what the uh, the ZX Spectrum used as well, and um, it was a great like foothold or, or starting point, but. Um, it was kind of strange because I was expecting to go from that up to PC and stuff and so on. But my my second gaming rig or gaming device was a uh, Mega Drive, uh, Sega Genesis. You'll probably know it as. Oh, okay. Um, and I had that with Sonic the Hedgehog, and it was fantastic. Played it to death. Uh, used Still to have fights with my too. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 like one of those things. It's around here somewhere, and it was between that and Desert Strike those two games that I used to play um, but again fantastic piece of kit and then later in the uh, uh, 80s it, in the 90s it was things like um, uh, oh what was I playing then uh, things like Civilization and Commander Keen and stuff like that on the on the PC uh, and then finally moving up to uh, the Sega Dreamcast and Shenmue which was Something I played through university. Yeah, you stated that you feel that uh, Shenmue is the the best video game ever. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I if I'm totally on board with best ever. It was a great game. Uh, why do you, why do you feel that way? Well, Shenmue was this f kind of like. Um, it was a particular point in my life. Uh, when I was at university, I was doing a lot of LAN parties because we didn't have, in the UK, we didn't have at the turn of the millennium things like uh, wired up campuses or anything like that. So if we wanted to have a, a like a, a LAN party or play things like Quake or uh, StarCraft, oh, the Quake. original ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the original Quake with the, oh, um, in fact, GL Quake, if you remember that, I remember going to my local um, electronics store and getting a, a, a 3D FX graphics card just so I could play GL Quake. That was, it feels so strange now to be saying oh, I bought a second card just for 3D graphics when now <laughs> you just buy one card that does everything. Um, but yeah, you had to like cart your machines and put them in one building together and then hook them up with a uh, coax cable. So I used to get a, a shopping cart from the local supermarket um, and then put my PC in it with this huge 14 inch CRT and push it through uh, the college campus with everyone giving me strange looks like why is he <laughs> pushing a, a PC in a shopping cart <laughs> but uh, yeah this was in the days before we had like proper internet or anything so but um, Shenmue was slightly different because when P at that time PC gaming was very much like brutal in your face shooty shooty or a bit of real time strategy or anything like that you didn't have anything that was particularly artistic or clever i guess the closest you got to it was if you ever played the original unreal that moment where you come out of the slave ship and you come out and you look and there's this waterfall there and it, you kind of go whoa this is a kind of like a sweet moment with in terms of the graphics because it's so atmospheric and picturesque but that's about as far as it went for pc gaming and shenmue was on the console was desperately trying to do something different. This whole representation of 1980s and 1990s um, Japan, despite the whole plotline thing, it was just the way it was put together. It was so aesthetically a whole piece that it was absolutely fantastic. And I, I gorged on it. I played it solidly for about four days until I completed the thing. And I loved every moment of that. I don't think I'd be able to get away with the same thing today. And the game I've played it again since it hasn't aged well at all the graphics yeah. look really dated now but at the time it was so radically different from anything i'd played before uh, i think it's a huge shame though because the game costs so much to make and there's i don't know if this is true or not but there was a rumor going around that even if they'd sold a copy to every single person that owned a dreamcast throughout the world it would it would have still made a loss oh, and i that's think that's cool. terrible I think that's a terrible shame, but and, and since then we've we even though we think, see things like Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls and stuff like that, 
it, it was kind of like that moment for me where it was a very strong contrast to what I was currently playing. And I think that's why it has that kind of fondness in my memory. Yeah, I've been in a Beyond Two Souls hole all week myself. That's a beautiful game. <laughs> I don't have a PS3, so it, it's oh. like I'm, I'm consuming it vicariously. I'm watching everyone else uh, play it either on, uh, on Twitch or, or talking about it or stuff like that. It's like I would really like to try and get in it because I know it's been panned by the critics somewhat. But I still think that there's a kind of place for games that go off on a kind of whimsy almost and try and do something a bit different. It's definitely different. It's, the The gameplay is strange, but it's so so beautiful to watch. Mm. It's, it's a great looking game. Do um, you feel that uh, Wildstar has any similarities to Shenmue? And, I think I think it does, um, and it's all about that sense of wonder. Uh, and it kind of latches a bit into World of Warcraft when I originally started playing it. When you go into a virtual world. It's nice to be um, surprised by unexpected things. And part of the difficulty when trying to get across a concept like Wildstar is that people look at it, they see a Pixar-inspired art style, and they think, it looks like WoW in space. They watch the videos, and they think, oh, the compact looks simple. It looks um, like anyone could play it, because they're just seeing very deliberately um, played out telegraphs and stuff like that. They don't see the whole kind of real difficult or, or complicated stuff. But it also means that you don't really get a chance to appreciate the whole sense of wonder as you explore the world. And there was this moment when I was playing back in February and I was climbing up this kind of tree thing. Uh, it was a kind of explorer puzzle or something like that. You climb up this whole tree and you get to the top and I looked down and I was looking across the whole landscape of Derudun. And I could see these kind of spiral patterns that had been etched into things like the paths and the grass lawn and stuff like that. And it was like those small artistic touches that you don't notice when you're watching the videos and you're kind of like at, at regular eye level, you, you, re you easily miss them, but you see them at that high level and you just take a moment to appreciate them you think actually there is a whole level of mystery and of uh, art artistry with this game that is very easy to miss but is there if you go looking for it and i think that's an important thing to bear in mind it's why i say to a lot of people play it first and then make your decision go to somewhere like new york comic con play it first or wait till open beta and then make your decision. Don't rely on um, the screen purely on the screenshots and the video that you see released. Yeah, I think those intricacies like that are what what really uh, drives my interest in those games. Uh, just thinking that they they put it in there with the thought that some people might never see it, but they still put all that effort into it. That, that really makes makes the difference as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It's things like when you. Um, you go wandering around and you find something like an abandoned campsite or something like that. Uh, it, I, I've got to be honest with you. My first character is going to be uh, an explorer. But that's because that's what I love doing. I love wandering around and discovering things. And it's not necessarily going to be an achievement or objective-led explorer. I'm going to go looking for anywhere I can get off the map or anywhere there's something hidden. And if the um, world designers reward me with a little campsite or a little kind of yeah. idol or a tiny bit of lore or something then that all the better yeah i'm gonna be a, a a stalker and i want to focus on recon so i gotta go exploring myself yeah gareth i know you've played the wild star uh kind of hands-on a little bit and you've dabbled around in it uh just bottom line what do you like best about the game so far i mean and and what things would you like to be see implemented later on so in terms of what I like about it, it's we've seen a lot recently about the kind of combat sandwich, they like to call it in their dev speak videos. Um, and they started off with talking about the bread and the meat and then the special source of ability mechanics. That's the part that I like about it. And I think they've really started to get that nailed now. Um, it takes the Guild Wars 2 approach, but it evolves it further. 
So one of the things I disliked about Guild Wars 2 was the indistinct uh, telegraphs, and they were generally just circles or stripes, and it was just chalk outline on the floor. So if you weren't particularly paying attention, they were quite easy to miss. If you weren't particularly adept at them, they were also quite easy to miss. And you only really came into contact with them when you were doing things like dungeons. So you'd go into Ascalonian catacombs and you'd see telegraphs on the floor. But out in the real world, unlikely. Uh, you'd probably just be trading blows with a, a monster somewhere, or you might see them uh, doing a particularly blatant move and dodge out the way or something like that. Wildstar takes that whole concept of free, active, dynamic combat a stage further. And at the simplest form, you have the um, these telegraphs on the floor and you can easily move out and dodge and stuff like that. And in the videos like the videos I did with Deridun, that's a kind of low level stage. You're only talking about level four or five there. So you're not going to have the most complex things in the world when you when you have those telegraphs kicking off. It's there to be easy to train people, to teach people how to play the game. It's only when you start um, getting higher up that it really starts making a difference. Now, I did get a chance to see uh, one of the dungeons at Arkship. And there is a little bit of B-roll footage, which has also been shown at uh, Gamescom. And I think uh, GameSpot actually had a video of it where you saw um, Storm Talon's Lair uh, being played in the background. And there you can see the telegraphs really start to become a lot more complicated and a lot more involved and stuff like that. And it's kind of like training. I've, I've spoken to the devs in the past and they say that the open world trains you for the dungeons. The dungeons then train you for the veteran dungeons at level 60, or le no, not level 60, uh, level 50, I think the cap is. Uh, and then the, um, uh, the veteran dungeons train you for the raids. And that's how it should be. You shouldn't have a completely disjointed experience where